This is Steffi and welcome to the Financial Fox Bitcoin series. So, I was at the Bitcoin Miami conference in May. I had to make a couple of transactions on Bitcoin and I actually realized that I didn't have a Bitcoin wallet on my phone. Uh, so, I asked around and somebody told me, you should download Xverse, it's great. So, I decided to get in touch with the CEO, Ken Liao. So, here, is my conversation with Ken Liao, CEO at Expert Wallet, a self-custody user-friendly Bitcoin wallet specifically designed for Web3. I hope you enjoy the discussion we had about security, we had about all the experimentation happening on the Bitcoin chain, but also we talk about the decentralized identity on Bitcoin, which is something that is very interesting. And uh, did you know that decentralized identity first started on Bitcoin? Well, I didn't. So that was quite interesting. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Ken. And if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button now and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our news and interviews. Hi, Ken. How are you? Good. Thank you. Well, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So shall we maybe start with, um, you know, one of uh, the key questions that I ask my guest. How did you get into Bitcoin? Sure. Yeah. So uh, for me, you know, I didn't get started in Bitcoin like super early. Uh, my first sort of full time job in, in crypto or blockchain in general was uh, 2017. That was when I joined the company that was building the Stacks blockchain, which is a smart contract layer on top of Bitcoin. Uh, but before that, I was very interested in Bitcoin. And I knew about it all the way back in, you know, 2014, 2013. I never really had the time or uh, spent the time to really dig into Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, I read about it and was very interested. Didn't really invest in Bitcoin either until like much later on. So uh, that was uh, a regret. But, uh, you know, I started working with the, the Stacks project on top of Bitcoin and gradually, you know, got to learn more and more about how Bitcoin functions and you know why we're building on top of it. We, we started by building sort of like a naming service uh, on top of Bitcoin directly. This was before we had the layer two. And basically you could register these uh, Web3 names on top of Bitcoin by sending these transactions. Um, and then from there, sort of, you know, the Stacks project evolved into like a layer two. Um, but I was always very much interested in Bitcoin in general, uh, even even just layer one. So I was basically seeing that there's, you know, projects like Stacks and other people building on top of Bitcoin. But the wallet experience was just not comparable to what you would see on other layer one chains, uh, you know, at the time. So you couldn't see anything that could give you the same kind of experience as MetaMask, right? Uh, but of course, uh, part of that reason is there is no like Web3 or real Web3 capability uh, on the Bitcoin chain. Um, but with projects like Stacks, um, Web3 was now possible. So I started this company in 2021 to focus on wallets for Bitcoin Web3. And in the beginning, because of my experience, you know, we first supported Stacks as, you know, the way to use Web3 on Bitcoin. Um, you know, you could do like NFTs, DeFi. And then beginning of this year, uh, 2023, that was when ordinals started to take off on Bitcoin. And we jumped on it because we saw ordinals as sort of like the layer one NFT-like protocol for, for Bitcoin. And because we already sort of supported Bitcoin NFTs, it was relatively easy for us to uh, also add support for ordinals. And basically, we were the first sort of standalone Bitcoin wallet that uh, could support ordinals. And now I think, you know, a large majority of the people that use ordinals are, are using X first. So, yeah. Okay, that's uh, brilliant. But let's uh, take a step back because you mentioned the Stack project, and uh, I think some uh, of my viewers they won't be so familiar uh, with the Stack 
and uh, the, I mean they know about Bitcoin but they are uh, uh, in a journey like uh, you know I was as well and they are uh, learning what is happening on the, the Bitcoin chain and uh, Bitcoin and Web3 um, so we need to kind of unpack a little bit uh, those concepts so perhaps if you can uh, uh, explain more about the start project and what does it mean building on Bitcoin yeah sure so the project uh, stacks, it started out uh, as sort of like just the identity uh, on top of Bitcoin. So decentralized identity on Bitcoin. Uh, and you could register these names, uh, what we call dot ID names uh, on Bitcoin. And it was all decentralized and, you know, anchored to Bitcoin using Bitcoin transactions. You could, you could generate these transactions where you write the data for this name in the op return of uh, the Bitcoin transactions. So the project started out that way. And pretty soon, uh, you know, we realized that there's going to be problems scaling this because uh, Bitcoin block space was pretty limited and the transaction fees started to go up. And if you were to scale this product to, you know, millions of users, uh, it just wouldn't be sustainable um, or, or scalable, right? So Stacks started to build a more scalable layer two on top of Bitcoin so that you could have things like decentralized identity uh, on Bitcoin, but in a, in a more uh, scalable way. So with that, they introduced smart contracts to Bitcoin as well. Um, so it became much more of like, there's now a lot more use cases that you could do uh, on Bitcoin, because now you have these more complex smart contracts compared to the Bitcoin scripts that uh, you have on layer one, which are very limited and you couldn't really do anything like uh, NFTs or uh, DeFi or decentralized exchanges using that. So with Stacks, now it's possible and, you know, it's still the work to build Stacks is still ongoing and there's you know, more exciting developments that are coming to Stacks, which I think will help Bitcoin scale uh, in the near future. Brilliant. Uh, and thank you for that. One uh, quite controversial aspect is about raising uh, um, the, f fee, the fee that you are uh, getting higher and higher. And um, obviously that become comes to the debate is that good to have all the experimentation on Bitcoin when the fees are getting more, you know, are getting higher. And, uh, you know, some people don't really like that because it becomes more expensive to transact on the Bitcoin network if you are doing only payments. Right. So I, I kind of would like to, you know, understand your views on uh, this development in the Bitcoin ecosystem? And do you think, uh, you know, is good for the future of Bitcoin? And also if you can maybe comment on also on the raising fee um, due to all this smart contract and all this new, new use case on Bitcoin. Yeah, so I think ultimately experimentation on Bitcoin is good for Bitcoin. You need to explore like what are, you know, the use cases for Bitcoin other than just store value and transacting, uh, you know, money, right? Uh, I think the argument that because fees go up, then it's not good for Bitcoin is frankly just ridiculous. Because if, if you look at Bitcoin right now, yes, there are, you know, millions of people using it. But in the grand scheme of things, if you want to onboard basically the entire world onto Bitcoin, the amount of transactions and people using Bitcoin you have right now is minuscule, right? So either way, when you're going to have like millions of people, billions of people using Bitcoin, the fees are going to go up, right? So we will have to find solutions to how we solve this problem and make Bitcoin more scalable. I think right now with these experiments running on Bitcoin, raising the fees, is a good test for you know the different scaling technologies on bitcoin and whether or not bitcoin the bitcoin chain itself is able to handle uh you know billions of people or, or even just hundreds of millions of people using using it right so uh i don't think that increasing fees is a bad thing for bitcoin i think maybe you know it might be some short-term pain but ultimately, 
it creates the incentive for people to build these layer twos. Uh, you know, for example, more work building out Lightning um, and other scaling layers like Stacks and uh, what we've seen recently uh, with you know zk rollups on top of Bitcoin. That's a that's a great answer, and um, you know, I I. I kind of agree with um, with your views as well. Experimentation is good, um, and uh, we should see also the result of that. And you know, being an incentive for development, um, it will be even uh, a greater achievement. Anyway, going back to decentralized identity on Bitcoin, so I want I want you to unpack that because I, to be honest, I didn't put it on my, um, you know, while I was planning the series, I kind of map out all different topics, but I didn't add that. And now you are kind of like, uh, yeah, surprising me with a topic that actually is that important because uh, we are seeing so many blockchain enabled cell sovereign identity solution build on Ethereum, build on Polygon. Um, Cardano is also doing that with Atala Prism. So there is so much. Uh, about decentralized identity going on and uh, yes we are still very early but it's good to understand uh, you know that actually there has been some experimentation on bitcoin as well so if you could uh, kind of give us an overview on of uh, um, you know how how it, it has started on bitcoin and where we are really with decentralized identity that would be quite helpful sure so i don't think many people know this but Decentralized identity started first on Bitcoin uh, oh. before even ENS and, and other other projects. The I think the, the main issue with decentralized identity on Bitcoin is once again the the scaling challenges, right? So it became like too expensive uh, very quickly on Bitcoin, and without strong complex smart contracts that offer advanced capability you couldn't really do all that much even if you had decentralized identity on bitcoin and i think once you know this did thing got to ethereum that's when it really started to take off a lot more because now uh, you know ethereum is already very popular uh, there's tons of applications that could take advantage of this decentralized identity right away Versus on Bitcoin, where it's you know not it was not very powerful, uh, I would say, and that has sort of changed in the in the past year or so, um, because now it is possible to have more complex smart contracts and applications on Bitcoin. So now decentralized identity on Bitcoin is again uh, much more important, and because most people are first interested in Bitcoin and then they move on to other chains. I think a lot of them still want to have that decentralized identity or whatnot uh, first with Bitcoin. So I think there's probably going to be a lot of development for DIDs uh, on Bitcoin. We've seen it first with Stacks uh, as a layer two, but now also there are people building naming systems on layer one with ordinals so there is a project called uh, dot sats or sns uh, names on bitcoin and you can actually go register these right now by making an ordinal inscription and i think the first sort of use case that you could you can have with these names is you can use it to transfer bitcoin using names instead of long addresses so that's already like a use case and I think in the future, as more um, development happens, you could use these names for other things as well. For example, you know, for messaging, uh, social media, um, you know, authenticating into applications and, and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty exciting what's happening with naming in Bitcoin. So, uh, Ken, are you basically saying that ultimately the future will see Bitcoin as a more developed ecosystem and perhaps will be the main cryptocurrency use and all the rest become noise. I mean, we have seen so much in the crypto space, so much development with Ethereum, layer two, many other layer ones. And Bitcoin has always been there. 
the first cryptocurrency in ever kind of like uh, developed in terms of use cases all these other chains but if we are looking at the future do you see bitcoin the the one that is going to be used uh, um, for everything or do you see more like a multi-chain world where bitcoin maybe is going to narrow down to a few use cases that suit better its technology so i think it's pretty hard to say at this point but uh, at least in the in the short like near-term future i don't think uh ethereum and other layer one chains are going away there are, there's things that ethereum can do that bitcoin can't uh, but there's also things that bitcoin can do ethereum can so i think for now at least there are sort of like pros and cons of using each one and they will probably coexist for for a while um, before maybe something something big happens if you know if one day you could do everything you could on ethereum but on bitcoin uh even cheaper and faster then i would i would say like um the the purpose of ethereum might be called into question but i think that's you know, very far off in the future. Okay, let's go back to self-custody of Bitcoin, which is obviously a main aspect and a main um, feature also of uh, these new assets, because Bitcoin is freedom of money, uh, so you can send what you want, you know, don't need a third party, ask permission to them. Uh, but at the same time, you are responsible uh, and you know to store, you, you, you need to know uh, how to best store your assets. So how important is self-custody and what are um, basically the way that people perhaps new to Bitcoin can custody their assets? Yeah, so I think self-custody for Bitcoin is really important. You know, you know keeping with the ethos of Bitcoin decentralization, it's very important that you have control over your money versus somebody else, right? Because if you just use a custody service, I think that sort of defeats the whole purpose of Bitcoin. And, you know, we've seen in the past that most people actually just tend to want to keep their Bitcoin on exchanges because uh, it's easy to do. That's where they bought their Bitcoin. And the the Bitcoin wallets that you can use for self-custody just weren't that great. Um, the learning curve was pretty steep and the and, and it was pretty unforgiving because you would have to know how to you know securely store a seed phrase, back it up, and if you screwed up, you could potentially lose all your assets, right? And that's not something pe most people are used to. So I think encouraging self-custody is the right way to go but at the same time you have to be able to provide easy ways for people to self-custody right and there are lots of companies building different kinds of solutions um, to do that for example you know you have like mpc multi-party computation you have um, people building like very complicated multi-sig solutions uh, where you know you have a copy of the of the key and then you store like different uh, copies of the key with like potentially a company and some custodian so that there's always uh, redundancy. And I think this will evolve. Eventually, we should get to a point where it's easy enough for people to self-custody and they, they wouldn't feel like they want to keep their Bitcoin on exchanges just because it's difficult to self-custody. And, you know, at, at Xverse, we were definitely looking into that as well. Uh, one of our main goals is actually to make the user experience easy so that most people who are not crypto natives um, feel comfortable using the, using the wallet. And it's an easy way for people to self-custody Bitcoin. So Ken, uh, tell me a little bit more about Xverse Wallet and its USB, because I have it on my phone. I know that I can also pull it up on my computer and it's meant to be a wallet used for transaction, right? So like a hot wallet. Yes, that's right. So the our mission is to enable Bitcoin Web3. So what that means is you can interact with applications to do all sorts of things like purchase NFTs or ordinals, uh, trade 
on decentralized exchanges, you know, participate in DeFi protocols to earn a yield, grow your assets. We want to do all that. And we are doing that by supporting all the different protocols building on Bitcoin, including Stacks, Lightning, Ordinals. And yeah, we're, we're, we're building for that right now, you know, specifically for Ordinals and BRC20 tokens, which is like a fungible token built on top of Ordinals. Uh, for those that don't know, we use a two address system in Xverse. So there's your regular Bitcoin address where you put your Bitcoin for payments or spending, right? And then we have a different address for Ordinals and BRC20 tokens. So the way we did this is because uh, Ordinals and BRC20 tokens, they are ordinal inscriptions so they are inscribed onto individual satoshis but these satoshis are just regular satoshis if the wallet isn't aware of you know things that are inscribed on these satoshis it will just spend it like regular bitcoin and it's very easy for the users to accidentally spend their ordinals uh, or send it away when they try to just send bitcoin right so before Xverse, if you used another Bitcoin wallet, you would need to uh, be able to freeze these unspent outputs, basically that had these inscriptions on them. And so that you, when you send out Bitcoin from your wallet, it doesn't spend them. But that requires you to know which ones exactly are ordinals. And that's not very easy to tell because they're just uh, a TXID. It's a, it's a long hash. And unless you look it up on an Explorer, you don't know, right? So with Xverse, we, we made it easy for users to do that. You don't have to know what an UTXO or unspent output is. Um, the, the ordinals and BRC20 tokens will show up in your wallet as an image, an asset, uh, or a balance of uh, a token, um, just as you would expect. And if you want to just transact regular Bitcoin, it all comes out from the Bitcoin payment address. So there's uh, no mixing involved here. And we've also built in a few sort of like safety features as well, so that if you accidentally have ordinals in your Bitcoin payment address, you could recover them and we'll warn you before you attempt to make a regular Bitcoin transaction, which might end up spending uh, that ordinal. Okay, that's uh, brilliant. That's very clear. Um, if we just pick up on that and talk a little bit about uh, uh, wallet security, and perhaps you can share, you know, the measure that you are taking for um, Xverse to keep it more secure, and and also how people can be more can take those measures to uh, maintain security of their wallet as well, because it's not just about what you can provide, uh, but also it's what also uh, users know yeah. in terms of like i should actually keep if i'm using this wallet i should be more careful about those things uh, because you know i don't want to lose my bitcoin i don't want to use my ordinals right yeah so we take security very seriously so uh, we are we have a very uh, robust internal process when it comes to uh, you know building on new features and and releasing updates to make sure that we don't introduce any vulnerabilities. And we go through third-party security audits um, and try to prevent anything from you know, falling through the cracks, right? And we also have a bug bounty program. So if anyone out there does discover uh, an issue, they could report it to us and we're incentivizing them to report it in private and giving us a chance to fix it before it goes out to public. But you're, you're right, like it doesn't really matter uh, how much effort is spent, you know, making the wallet sort of bulletproof. The, the most common way for people to uh, lose their assets is actually from scams and social engineering because people, it's, it's very difficult for people to understand some of these things and because it's, it's very complicated stuff, right? And it's easy for some scammer to come in and say, Here's a link, uh, click on it, put in your seed phrase and, you know, will help solve your problems or something like that. We've seen it happen a lot. And I think it's, it's up to, you know, everybody in the ecosystem, including wallets um, and 
people who build applications to educate the users on you know what to what not to do, uh, what is a scam to prevent these things from happening. Um, so I think yeah, two things. One, we of course take security very seriously uh, on the builder side, but also we want to uh, be able to educate users so that they don't fall prey to to scams and exploits. Yeah, exactly. And when uh, when you start to get into Web three, that's where all the problems start because you know you get phishing email basically all the time. Now, wallet. Uh, um, has always been uh, kind of like a controversial service because, um, I mean, if we look, for example, everything happening on uh, uh, the other chains, a wallet is connected to a, an address, that is connected to an identity, and then it needs to be regulated. If you are joining DeFi, there is KYC that you actually should be doing. So I would like to understand what are your views on regulation and also uh, some thoughts perhaps on uh, wallet and uh, identity attached to it. I mean, all the concept about Bitcoin is being anonymous, right? But uh, with, the, with wallet addresses and getting into Web3, then it becomes uh, trickier, right? Yeah, so I think especially when it comes to Bitcoin, privacy is very important. If you ask like the Bitcoin OGs, they would basically tell you the whole po whole point of Bitcoin is that uh, you can stay private and you don't have to uh, reveal your identity to send people money, right? But I think for governments, that definitely is uh, problematic because they always want to maintain a level of control and know where money is going, where money is coming from, uh, of course, because people are using it for, you know, illegal purposes, right? I think uh, for wallet builders, we definitely need to keep a close eye on regulation because there's, there's a lot going on right now and different laws and regulations are being proposed. And, you know, as, as a builder, we, we have to comply to these laws, right? We, we will just have to watch out for them. Um, and also at the same time, uh, we have to sort of be thought leaders and educate not just the users, but also the lawmakers on, uh, on why things are a certain way and what people are using crypto for. And, you know, to make sure that these regulations don't actually, you know, cause unintended consequences and, or, or just even kill, you know, crypto or certain use cases completely uh, because I think that would be counter to to the whole point of of these laws right so yeah you know that's that's basically all I have to say in terms of regulations and uh, what about interoperability I mean is the idea to have Bitcoin interoperable with other chain I mean all this experimentation is great and uh, you know you are also building a wallet are you considering adding more chain in the future do you want uh, to actually stay only focused on bitcoin what are your thoughts on uh, interoper chain interoperability so i think we definitely want to have more interoper interoperability between chains it just depends on uh, what that use case is if a use case comes up like you know in the near future uh, or right now and that requires experts to support another chain, I think we would do that. Um, I think in the future, if it's going to be a multi-chain world, we definitely will need to support multiple chains. But for now, we, we're going to focus on Bitcoin. Um, but at, if opportunity arises, we'll definitely support other chains. Yeah, and, and there's, there is already some projects that, that's building uh, interoperability between Bitcoin and other chains. Uh, for example, we we are working with a company called DLC Link, and they what they're working on is uh, using Bitcoin DLCs, discrete law contracts. You could lock up Bitcoin uh, on on the Bitcoin chain itself and use that to borrow some assets on a different chain. That will be done through you know some some oracles, um, but it's already kind of like introducing interoperability to Bitcoin with other chains. There is so much happening now on Bitcoin that is amazing, amusing, and um, very challenging, I guess. So where, 
I mean, if I'm kind of like a newbie to the space and I want to know what is happening and where should I go? I mean, is Twitter the space where all this conversation is happening? How my viewers can enter the community and uh, get to know everything that is happening uh, uh, right now in Bitcoin? So I think, unfortunately, Twitter is probably the best place uh, to, to learn about these things and keep up with all the developments. But it's not actually very user friendly because you would have to know who to follow right? Yeah. And follow the right people in order to get into that ecosystem. Um, but unfortunately, that's where most of the discussion and, and sort of like thoughts and ideas are happening. So I don't think there's any alternatives, better alternatives right now. But maybe it's, it's worthwhile to bring all this discussion onto the, you know, just normal websites, not like, uh, sort of like, on Twitter, where you have to know exactly who to follow to be involved in these sort of conversations. Yeah, first of all, you need to be on Twitter. <laughs> right. Some people, I mean, I guess the most of the people watching anyway, they are on Twitter. But if you would have to say three people that you must follow to kind of get into the loop of those conversations, who are those? A part of yourself and obviously. <laughs> So uh, I think if, you, if you're interested about ordinals, I think you could follow uh, T.O., so Trevor Owens. He, he runs uh, the Ordinal Show, which is uh, probably the most popular uh, Twitter spaces on ordinals right now. And because a lot of the things happening on Bitcoin is right now related to ordinals, you will find out about them uh, through through this trader spaces. Let me think who else you should follow. There, there are a ton of builders, to be honest, uh, in the space. And uh, maybe if you're interested in like layer twos, like stacks, you should follow Manip, uh, who is uh, one of the founders of the, the stacks blockchain. So I think you'll learn a lot from following him as well. Yeah. Otherwise, I think, you know, you should just follow the, the people that, that engage with you know, Trevor and Manib uh, to learn more about, you know, ordinals or other sort of technology being built on Bitcoin. Okay, Ken, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, anybody that is interested in uh, looking up your wallet, where should they go? Yeah, so if you want to uh, use Xverse, go to xverse.app. And from there, you can download the app for Android, iOS or Chrome extension. Um, and you can always join our Discord server uh, to you know, chat with us and uh, find out more about Xverse. And perhaps make suggestion. You know, it's all about user experience anyway. So I guess that you have got a channel where people can, uh, you know, make proposal. No, maybe not make proposal, but you know, submit their proposal, or submit their suggestion, right? Yes, and uh, you can also do that on Twitter. So if you you can follow us on Twitter, uh, our handle is Xverse App. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me.